Lord God, thank you for this wonderful day and uh, wonderful chance to be reminded of how everything that Jesus does is for us. Thank you for the message today and, and for those who are yet to hear it. Uh, we, we ask that you would fill them. We thank you for the chance to gather around these tables to encourage one another and to grow together. Humble us to recognize our deep need to be in your word. Humble us to also see our deep need to be connected to your church. And uh, Lord, we just simply ask uh, now that you would, uh, by your Holy Spirit's power, lead us to growth and wisdom and faith. And also, especially, we ask your care upon those who are newer to this text or studying the Bible in general. Help them not to feel overwhelmed, but rather encouraged and enlightened. Uh, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Come on in. Shh. All right. A few things. This is a really important point I'm going to make. Um, you know, I want to I address, I went to last week, many of you who were here would remember, I hope, I wasn't here. Um, hopefully it makes an impact. I was off at Camp Barakel with our youth. And they were much more behaved than all of you. All right. <laughs> when I talked, they were quiet and listening. And, uh, they, um, it was really great. I, I don't spend a lot of time with our youth anymore. Not by not wanting to, but, you know, like Wednesday night I have church when the senior high have youth. Right now I'm here. They're in their youth room. You know, so I teach in our school, but as far as youth group, I haven't done a lot of that. It was awesome to go. And uh, I left encouraged. I mean, these kids... A while back, I would say there's always been kids who like youth group, and there's always kids who like ch more or less coming to church, being connected that way. But these kids, not only that, they were really connected to Jesus, and there is a difference there, and, uh, and that was a really cool thing. But one thing that I really liked, one thing I really liked, and it's just an encouragement for us being around these tables today, is, you know, you've heard me mention how you can't live your life on mountaintop experiences. That is a false paradigm for Christian growth. Meaning, if a kid only involves themselves in Camp Barakel and summer youth gatherings, the high probability exists that they are going to not be Christian adults, speaking in generalizations. But we've all seen that happen. We could point to countless youth where that's the case. And uh, the speaker last week, what I loved was you know, he recognized that the kids were at the mountaintop, they love being there, all that stuff. But then the whole Sunday morning talk was about the local church and its place in God's mission. And he just directly told them, you cannot live your Christian faith apart from the local church. And more and more, you know, we all know people who say that, oh, I, I don't need to go to church to be with God. It's not a matter of what you think you need, like that regard. It's one, you need it more than you think, but two, it's also, we forget, the local church has been established so that this kind of stuff can happen, but it's also God's plan now for taking the word to the world. And so, you know, if you pay attention on social media, it's a dime a dozen nowadays, the articles that are written lamenting the local church. And everybody has their series of 10 things the church has done wrong to screw up your faith, or the church has done this wrong, or the pastors need to do this better. There's an article every day I could find on there, and it becomes exhausting. We, we don't shy away from here talking about the local church has tons of warts and scars. It is a totally imperfect place, and yet God has preserved it for 2,000 years because it's in his plan and in his design. But anyway, my point is, is, you know what? I know some of us in here struggle with that on certain weeks. Do I need to be there? Or even as you're here, there's a little bit of holding back. Just recognize how God is working, and he is at work, and what a blessing this is. I hope we'll experience that today through our discussions. And it was awesome to see the kids experiencing that in a real way last week. So, uh, and I think it was great for them to get to know me better. And uh, I always tell the kids when we go on retreats to be careful how they go back and tell stories to their parents. And so if any of you had a kid there, there's always a context to what they report. Just uh, if you want to know what that is, come and ask me. All right. In light of that. Ah! 
It's in a black hole, yeah. Could you switch that slide, Tom? It's not moving. Um, okay, so I, look at your sheet, and we'll get this fixed while you're talking at your uh, tables. There are two predominant thoughts about baptism. Today we're talking about the baptism of Jesus. One, baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, and that's our view at Shepherd of the Lakes. And then two, what you're going to find like in Baptist churches, a lot of your non-denominational churches, which are really Baptist churches or Reformed churches, um, an outward proclamation of an inward change. So um, that's why they wouldn't baptize uh, children. Uh, so we're at the opening discussion question, Tom. Jesus would not have needed to be baptized for forgiveness since he was perfect, okay? So we say baptism is for the forgiveness of our sins. He wouldn't have needed that. And then secondly, uh, he, would have had to sig- he would not have had to signal that he had come to faith since he had been unified with his Father for all of eternity. So what I want you guys to think about at your tables is why would he be baptized? Take a few minutes to talk about that. All right. All right. All right. Yeah, I can't I see your t- I can tell it's a, it's a lively bunch today. I I don't know that I'm going to be able to keep control. So, you know, hopefully what comes out here in the class is understanding better what Jesus' baptism was signaling and what it was doing. You know, because his need for baptism didn't exist in, in any way, and yet he was baptized. Um, and so that'll, that'll come out. But, you know, we are also, I hope, going to get a better understanding of why we, are, why we believe what we believe about baptism, why it's consistent with the scriptures and what Jesus is offering uh, through it. And... Uh, And that especially if there's one thing that is going to come out today, and certainly it's the title of Pastor Vogel's sermon, and it's just a way of thinking, everything is for you. And what I'm seeing is that even amongst uh, people from our uh, tribe of believers, we are using more and more language, because it's just so predominant out there, about language about what we do, what we're doing for Jesus. And so even baptism is often now discussed as something that we're doing. And that's really inconsistent with what the scriptures are teaching or what it's offering us. We're going to see that everything that is given to us is for us. Everything that's done is for us. And so uh, just keep in mind those words today. For you, for you. Jesus is for you. So let's look at this prophecy here from Isaiah chapter 40. And this is a foreshadowing of what we're going to see uh, in the ministry of a man named John, uh, John the Baptizer. And so a voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Now, last week, you would have learned that preparing for the way of the Lord... Being prepared did not mean that we do something or we build, but rather we become torn down and we do nothing. Proper preparation is to live by faith. And to live by faith means to know that we need a Savior and that we can do nothing for ourselves. So here it says, you know, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. What are we getting a picture of there? Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain will be made low. What is God giving us a glimpse of? What's he telling us is going to happen? The new heavens and the new earth that are going to be ushered in upon Jesus' return. Quick aside, 
You heard Pastor Vogel, those of you who are already in church, uh, mention that somebody in our church lost their young adult son this week. I had put it, something out on Facebook, but I hadn't mentioned the name because not all of their family knew yet. But Volker and Elke Trout, who go here, their 26-year-old son Daniel died unexpectedly during the night the other night. And uh, worst thing ever. And for those who may be interested to know, the funeral will be here Tuesday at 11 and a viewing at 10 here. And that's all of the things that are happening around it and then a lunch and following. But anyway, you've heard me say that our hope even has to be more than we die and go to heaven. That the, the Christian hope has to be more than that because, okay, Daniel's with the Lord. He's at peace with the Lord. But what is still true for his parents? They're living through the worst thing. And we acknowledged when we talked to them they now have a new normal of pain that on this side of heaven is never going to go away. It may be dulled, but it's going to be traumatic. We actually had Jim Lesher, uh, who now it's five years since his son died, go and talk to them, and he shared how this journey is of pain with them, and it was helpful for them. But what God is telling us is that what the Lord is coming to do, what Jesus is coming to do, is not just make our life in this world better. That is not the mission of Jesus. And if you believe that Jesus is a coach, or a motivator, or leads you to your best version of yourself, then what does everything come crashing down? When does everything come crashing down? When in spite of all of your best efforts and walking with Jesus, your child dies. Or even less dramatic, you lose a job or you, your spouse leaves, whatever it is. The ministry of Jesus was radically different than what people were expecting. He came into a creation that had been tainted by sin and he's saying, I am coming to make all things new. So even as we go to a funeral, this is the proper biblical way of things. Is we can have joy that the person who has passed away in faith is at peace with the Lord. Their soul is at rest with the Lord. The Bible says it's good, kind of describes them as being asleep. Yet, we recognize that here on this earth, things are still not as they should be. That's why I always am such a stickler about that phrase that somebody's looking down on us from heaven. Not just to be a jerk and correct people with that phrase, but because what's true is this world still is not as it should be, and that person, thankfully, has been released from all of it. And so we don't want them looking down. That is not good for them. That's selfish of us to want that because what they're seeing then is war, famine, evil, hatred, all of that. No, they're released from it. Jesus is one day going to release the whole world from it. Okay, so that's what Isaiah is promising. Well, what's the way of proper preparation? To recognize our brokenness and our deep need, to see the brokenness of this world, to know... This is not as it should be, and I don't need a better life. I need a whole new life. So, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way, the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. And so here we're connecting it to John announces this. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Let's give you some context here. Mark connects John the Baptist with the one preparing the way written about in Isaiah. This means he is stating Jesus as the Lord God of Israel himself, no higher claim is possible. Mark roots the gospel of Jesus Christ as deeply as possible in the historic ancient religion of Israel. Jesus was not just something that came out of the blue 
and kind of caught fire and people uh, started to build up myths about him after uh, he was here on earth. It is very important for the Bible to declare this Jesus was always the plan and it unraveled itself throughout history. Christianity, he says, is not a new thing. Jesus is a fulfillment of all the prophets' longings and visions. And he is the one who will come and take down mountains and rise up canyons. I.e., in other words, he will restore and remake the universe. Thus, Jesus and his gospel are rooted in the expectation of God's return to rule the earth. Okay, you know, it caught me in another, we read the Luke gospel in uh, our worship service, the, that version of Jesus' baptism. And it's interesting how it worked. A phrase caught me. It says that, you know, there's going to be those who are saved, but there's going to be some unbelievers who are thrown into the unquenchable fire. All right? Thrown into the unquenchable fire. The next sentence says that uh, there was st- they, John and still went around and was preaching the good news. You get that? They're telling you, in, in our society, what is the worst thing we can possibly appear to be in our society? Like, what is the unforgivable sin in America that you are considered judgmental? All right? You are considered judgmental. Even though everybody is, and, uh, you know, but here, Jesus, the, the scriptures are telling us there's judgment. And it connects that to being good news. Because what is the good news? Here, you've got John coming and calling people out of it. Is Christianity exclusive? 100% no. Is Christianity narrow? 100% yes. All other, re- let me tell you what I mean. All other religions are exclusive. All other religions are exclusive. Every other religion says, you must do this to attain this, which means what? You didn't do this, you don't attain. Only Christianity has one who says, everybody, you're invited onto the path. It excludes no one based on race, history, acts, no acts, whatever the case may be. Now it's narrow, because you have to get on the one path. And in, you know, going further than you could say, well, those who who aren't on the path are excluded. But the good news is, is that God's going to remake this world. He's inviting everyone to experience that. We're being invited out of this sin and this life and into a whole new life. But what do you have to know exists for that to be good news? Sin and the bad life. Okay? So if we go around as people do now in our day and age, kind of claiming that everything's all right and you have your own truth and if it works for you, it's good. Can you go to that person and tell them that Jesus has brought forgiveness of sins and uh, the hope of everlasting life in a new kingdom? Why would they care? Why would they care? But, but, like I saw this week, when you're confronted with a horrible, tragic death, the rubber hits the road, and you're like, there's what Jesus offers, and, and then there's everything else. Because when you look at that person's life, and this is why people, they lie at funerals, and we go out of our way to do it. Because we tell you everything about this person, we're trying to say they did enough to attain. They always had a smile. They always did this. They always did that. It's a bunch of untruths. And and we know that deep down. And when we realize that, we want to be able to say, but Jesus has called us onto the path and he's invited us. And that's good news. And so that's why our funerals here are always focused on Jesus. I had somebody, sh- and, and you know what? It, it's not as popular. Nobody's asking me or signing me to a book deal. 
um, and uh, I'm not going to be on TV anytime soon, and, uh, and all of that, and yet we had somebody who came, called in, hit their rock bottom this week, and um, they had been here a year and a half ago for a funeral, and so uh, when they hit their rock bottom, th- they, they used what they heard and said, I need that, that's what I need. That's what I need. And so uh, God's working in his own time, and I got to meet with that person this week and pray with them and all of that, and, and God's working in his time, and his word doesn't come back void, and so we have somebody who hadn't been in a church in 20 years showing up saying, give me more of that. I need that Jesus. And it's, it's awesome news to see that happening. So what you have here now, let's, let's kind of break down what's happening with this, what's called a baptism of repentance. Kind of look at the history here. Because it's odd that baptism's even taking place. Jews did not originally practice washing or baptism. Okay, so that's who John's talking to here, are Jews before the death and resurrection of Jesus. And they had not had as their original covenant with God or a practice or ritual, baptism or washing. They were considered clean through their various sacrifices and rituals. So they had their whole religious system. You go to the temple, you offer a sacrifice, and uh, you are right with God. So this was not a part of their early history. Eventually, Jews used baptism, and maybe didn't call it that, but it was in in its essence the same thing, as a ritual cleansing after such acts as touching a leper or a corpse. So for them, in their life, being clean or unclean was everything. And so if they touched something where they were considered unclean, well, then they went through this ritual cleansing. And then this fulfilled the requirements of them being able to enter the temple to offer a sacrifice. It was akin to doing what? Taking a bath. All right? Gentiles who wanted to convert to Judaism had to be baptized to be considered clean. So that's the history to that point. Now, John is coming and signaling that everyone needs to be baptized. Your pedigree and moral record did not matter. So it wasn't just, okay, you touched a leper and you got dirty because of it, and now you need to go through this ritual cleansing. John's coming and saying, There's something in you, about you, that is unclean. And it doesn't matter if you're a Jew or you're a non-Jew Gentile. I'm coming to tell everybody that you need something else. And so John is preparing people for the coming of Jesus. His baptism is preparing people for Jesus through repentance. So when John is preaching this baptism of repentance... What is he trying to get people to recognize? And what what do what by seeing their sin, what what does he want them to see? That they have been walking this way, this path, and it's totally the wrong path. And so repentance, you've heard, a lot of you have probably heard it's akin to turning around and getting on the right path. John's inviting them onto the right path that's ultimately going to be fulfilled through Jesus Christ. What I like to think of repentance as is just this utter brokenness, this depravity that that gets us to this point to say, I'm not just sorry because something went bad or I did something wrong, but rather I recognize I am totally incapable of justifying myself. I am totally incapable of justifying myself. And I'd like that thought to stick with you because what is our temptation if we're really being honest? If I came to your homes today and using the scriptures and not my own opinion, I offered up an opportunity for you to see where perhaps you've been drifting off the path. What will be your first temptation? How many of you will be, why thank you pastor for coming and blessing me. (laughs) with your presence and godly rebuke today. 
I am most thankful that you are here, and I am seeing very clearly where I have fallen short of the glory of God and uh, have now been led to the cross. (laughs) But you're a room full of Christians. Why wouldn't you react that way? Instead, what we would have is some people range from outright defiance and get out of my house or I'll just find a new church to uh, sharing with me but all of the ways that you are doing well. All right? And at the end of the day, no matter what it is, no matter if it's a pointing finger or defiance or whatever, all of it is an opportunity for you to try to say what? I don't really need Jesus. The Jesus I'm following is the Jesus who's helping me be a better version of myself. The Jesus I'm following is really a Jesus who agrees with the things that I already believe. I have set the standard of what I believe, and I have found a church and a Jesus who is most compatible with that. And that's very, very dangerous. Very, very dangerous. And John is coming and saying, you all need to get that at the point of brokenness. Now, who can remember who did not like John's message and stood to the side and would not be baptized? Who did not like John's message? And then who did Jesus, in turn, rebuke consistently through his Uh, ministry a group of very religious people people you might remember their name pharisees sadducees and they're like no no we don't need this because we are from abraham and we are the chosen people and we have done this sacrifice and we have followed this law and they're using their goodness They're using their goodness to be led away from Jesus. I have been more struck in the last year or two by the fact that where we're really losing people from the Christian faith is not in their moral depravity. How many of you here grew up with this picture of believers look a certain good way, buttoned up, and the people who are apart from Jesus are kind of the drunks on the railroad tracks? All right? You know what I'm finding? We can reach the drunks on the railroad tracks. And I'm finding that the people who are the buttoned up, religious looking people want nothing to do with the real Jesus. Even if they're very religious. I would would suggest that we are losing more people from the Christian church today through their moral goodness than through their moral depravity. And read the scriptures. If you're ever tempted to point out those people as being bad. How Jesus always goes to the bad, like the woman at the well, who's repentant and offers her good news, and how he goes to the Pharisees, who are not repentant, and offers them judgment and harshness. Very, very, very interesting for us. So people who were baptized by John later had to be rebaptized. And Jesus still had to die on the cross. So you're, you're hearing, okay, they're going to be baptized with repentance for the forgiveness of sins, but still they had to be rebaptized later. And Jesus still, even though there was the forgiveness of sins offered, had to die on the cross. What's going on here? Take just a few short minutes to talk about that at your tables. All right. Don't want to take too much time on that one. So, what I, what I would just call into mind here is that consistently through the Bible, you have this, people are working on the information they have. They're putting their faith in a promise. You know, in the Old Testament, God had given Abraham a promise. All people on the earth are going to be blessed through you. Later, you know, they had faith in the promise. God worked uh, in that way to save his people. Here, 
John is calling people to repentance and people are now uh, looking forward to the one who's going to come and fulfill this. All right, and then it all becomes clear after Jesus' death and resurrection that this is uh, what he has done. He has come to bring us this new life, the forgiveness of sins, and ultimately the new heavens and the new earth. He makes us a new creation. But John's work is simply uh, a glimpse of preparing people for it. It offers forgiveness, but it's, it's made final, complete, in Jesus' death and resurrection. And the promise then comes that and after Jesus' death and resurrection, the church is going to be formed on Pentecost, and now in baptism, every, belie- every Christian, every baptized person is going to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, um, in those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. So why is Jesus baptized? He had that original question. He didn't need forgiveness. He didn't need to make an outward commitment of faith to his Father. Martin Luther said this, Christ accepted baptism from John for the reason that he was entering into our stead. Indeed, our person. That is, becoming a sinner for us, taking upon him the sins which he had not committed and wiping them out and drowning them in his holy baptism. Jesus is always our substitute. Jesus is in place of us for us. So when he's baptized, what is he carrying? Our sins. When he dies on the cross, what is he carrying? Our sins. So that when the Father says he's well pleased with him, who is he also well pleased with? Us. When Jesus dies on the cross, who gets the benefit of his life? Us. Okay? So you see here, the Father is pleased with the Son because of his righteousness. Jesus is an acceptable substitute. And then the Spirit's present is meant to assure Jesus of the love God the Father has for him. The Spirit is at work in our lives to do the same. I had a question on our 7th and 8th grade religion quiz this week, and uh, um, it was real fitting through a number of circumstances this week when you think of what is the devil trying to consistently get us to do or to doubt? What are the two things that the devil does not want us to believe about God? Those of you may be familiar with C.S. Lewis's quote on this. He wants us to believe that God is powerful but not loving or loving but not powerful. Okay, so you lose a child and he wants you to believe he's powerful enough to do something about it but he didn't love you enough to do anything about it. Or he loves you enough to do something about it but he's not powerful enough. All right, so that's what the devil's consistently trying to get us to do so that we do not trust Jesus, so that we do not turn to him, all right? And so the Spirit's presence is there to, in our lives to lead us to know that God does love us and he is powerful. That assurance was in Jesus' life when he was baptized. Now, what, can, what, what event should we recall in our life if we ever doubt that? We should recall the promise made in our baptism that we are children of the Heavenly Father, that He will not forsake us, that He does all things for our good. It's, it's tough, based on circumstances, to believe that at times. And the devil is going to use all of those circumstances. But lest you think that Jesus didn't go through all of this himself, it is very, very telling, and we'll talk more about this in two weeks, but today we'll touch on it, very, very telling what, what is the next event in Jesus' life after he is baptized? Who knows? He gets led into the wilderness to be tempted. It, it, if anyone promises you that if you become a Christian, your life will be better, they are either misinformed or lying to you. All right? There is no promise attached to the Christian faith 
that your life on this earth will get better. There are countless evidences that it may very well get worse. And in those moments of it getting worse, we think God is not powerful or God is not loving. We must go back and remember what happened in Jesus' life. Because if you hear that someone loves you, what would you not expect from them? Harm or trouble or punishment or any sort of thing that we view as negative. All right? In America today, modern parenting is marked by, I love my child, therefore what I am going to do is do everything everything possible to ensure their success because my love will be marked by them never having to suffer. All right? And it is destroying children in the name of love and in the name of provision. And I see it happening here. I see it, temptations of it in my own life. And we have been duped into believing that if someone loves you, that they will never say the harsh word, that they'll never say the condemning word, that they'll never lead you to go without, all right? And uh, the church, how many of you have felt pressure as Christians or as church members? Or how many of you placed pressure on church leaders that if someone, uh, if we want to show love, what can we never offer as a way of loving someone? Any sort of anything bad that love from the church has to be total acceptance of everything. And that is actually not love at all. And so Jesus, remember this, Mark 1, the Spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. Immediately. Okay, I love you, son. Immediately you're in the wilderness. And he was in the wilderness 40 days. Okay, I had to punish a child in my home yesterday. They were punished for 40 seconds. <laughs> and it was the worst thing ever. <laughs> Being tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild animals. And the angels were ministering to him. All right? So here he goes immediately to the wilderness. What does the wilderness often convey in the scriptures? Loneliness, emptiness, all right? And, and the 40 days, 40 is often a number of completeness in the Bible. So Jesus goes and he's, and he's showing us he's up to the test. He's going to fulfill all the righteousness that we cannot. But right away, he's, he's sent out into the wilderness. Jesus is tempted. Satan targets those who are children of God. He often leaves those outside of the family alone. Can you remember this? Please. And can you especially remember this if you see a Christian fall? That rather than just offering the flippant, culturally expected phrase that they were hypocrites and insincere, that instead we see that perhaps we don't even begin to know the work that the devil was doing on them. And that the devil was doing that not only to lead them away from Christ, but by leading them away from Christ others would be led away from Christ. So might Satan leave alone those people who are already apart from Christ? So might it be that those who are not believers might have a very much easier time being moral people? Because already Satan is saying, I have them. I have them right where I want them. They think they're saving themselves by their goodness. They think they're saving themselves by their goodness. And here we see that the children of God are targeted by the devil. All right? So being a believer does not mean that you're going to be free from that. Being a believer means you are going to absolutely face that. I've told you this before, and it bears repeating. I see it happen every time we have a new member class. Or just a new group of new members come in. There's inevitably going to be a group or a portion of that that are at the mountaintop and get this view that living, joining a church, starting to walk with Jesus is life at a mountaintop. 
And then they are woefully unprepared for what comes next. And we try to prepare them, but some people just not listening, whatever. And they're woefully unprepared for what comes next. And so they go from, okay, they're joining the church and everybody's clapping for them when they get announced in front of the church and they get to meet with the pastors and the pastors are welcoming them and da, 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 da. And then the next Sunday they come and, wait a minute, now I have an offering envelope and, uh, and nobody said hi to me today and uh, well, this isn't what I thought it was at all. It sounds like I'm making light of it, but I can guarantee you it happens. I can guarantee you it happens. We are woefully unprepared. We've lost a family, we think, from the church, largely in part because suppose one of the pastors was at a grocery store and didn't acknowledge them well enough. And, and these are things where we, we just are unprepared. But what I would say is that that person or those types of people, they're not... The, Satan's targeting them too. He's trying to get at them. So what do we do when we're tempted? We recognize, one, Jesus is led by the Spirit into the wilderness. God does not tempt us, but he does not necessarily shield us from the wilderness. Recognize it what it is. It is not God at work in your life to bring you harm. He's not necessarily shielding you from it. He's not necessarily bringing you out of it yet, but it's not him who's doing the tempting. Don't place the blame on him. The blame goes on Satan who does the tempting. Growth happens in the valley when we utilize God's word. Suffering produces character, perseverance, and hope. A promise of Romans 5. Your children, families who sent kids to a retreat recently or sending them to the National Youth Gathering, all right, those are good experiences, mountaintop experiences. But where are they really going to learn the Christian faith? Day by day by day by day by day in the valley, in the punishments where you model Christ and say, I'm going to offer you godly discipline. You are on the wrong path, child. You will get your 40 seconds of punishment. But, but, I will not leave you there. Instead, you are forgiven, you are set free, you are my child, you are God's child, we are reconciled, we now live freely, we do not have that event held against us, we move forward. Modeling that day by day by day by day by day is where your kids are really going to learn the Christian faith and where they're going to grow in it and it's where it's going to produce character and perseverance and hope. Our growth is happening in the valley. We get a respite at the mountaintop every now and then, and we need them. We need retreats, all right? We need them, but we do not replace uh, God's work in the valley with them. When we are struggling, it is good to remember that Christ stood in our place and suffered even more. So he does not do against us what was not done against him. He stood in our place. He faced suffering and death, and he did it so that as we endure, what is the promise? I promise you that your light and temporary, your, your circumstances, your sufferings are light and temporary in light of the eternal glory that is yours in Jesus Christ. So, Lastly, real quickly here, there's a trend in our community of people being rebaptized. And that's because there's a slew of non denominational churches. Again, most of those non denominational churches are really Baptist churches or Reformed churches that baptize adults. They just haven't aligned to a church body. But, you know, kids get involved in the youth group, whatever, and they tell these kids, you must be rebaptized. What I want to leave you with, because I'm seeing that kind of go around social media, I'm seeing it even amongst kids who've been here, I'm seeing parents confused because they want anything to see that their kids are going to follow the Lord for their life. Every time that I've seen this happen, what it is is this child saying, I, this is about me, this is about my commitment. What I would say is we don't need that because what, it, what Christianity is about first and foremost is Jesus committing to us. Jesus has made a commitment to us. So it is unnecessary to rekindle that relationship because he doesn't break the relationship. 
It is not necessary for us to enter into a covenant because we've never, ever had it broken if we were baptized when we were younger, even if we can't remember the event. And why? So it's unnecessary, but why is it even perhaps detrimental? Because any time we begin to think that our life with God is good because of our commitment or because of our outward act, it's taking our eyes and hearts and minds off of the gospel. And so just be on guard against that teaching because it's hard to see it as anything negative because we're just so happy that kids are in church nowadays. I get it. Uh, but I, I would be really, really cautious about it because let's just instead teach them the real thing. God made a promise to you, child, when you were a baby, and he's never going to break that promise. He's never going to break it. And, and so you can trust in that promise. And not only, I know you can't remember that event, but I do know this, God's been at work every day in your life since that event. Let's teach our kids that, about what Jesus has done for them, what he has done for you. All right, great talk. Chili cook-off in a little bit. Woo-woo. Go in peace, serve the Lord. All right.